Sound check, everything good? Everybody hear me? Great. Let me take my phone out and turn it down this morning. I had someone call me and look for directions for church, and I had no idea who they were. So, <laughs> wrong number. All right, let's start out with uh, prayer before we get into this here. <clears throat> Lord, I just thank you for your word, and I thank you that we can study it, and that we have the freedom to do that here in, in church and even every day in our lives, and we just pray that we'll do that. Uh, we pray that we can take these um, ideas, these truths in, in Romans 12, 12, and apply it to our lives, and that uh, you will supernaturally give us the power to do that, Lord. And I just pray that you speak through me to open hearts and open minds. Amen. All right, yeah, let's go there. Romans 12, 12. Revisit where we've been. <clears throat> um, I'll start a little early. I'll start in, line, in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not logging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope persevering in tribulation, and devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Okay, Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tri tribulation, and devoted to prayer. Okay, So this morning, um, other translations would say patient in affliction. Okay, So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, this morning. Um, a common question for people to ask for even centuries is, if God, then what about suffering? Or even, what about evil? Okay, And they see people suffering and they wonder about, just as we sang about, a good God. Okay, How can God be good? Um, and uh, that often forms into the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Okay, There's a lot wrong with that question. Okay, It depends on what you mean by good. Okay, um, Society's definition of good would be completely different, different than a Christian's definition of what uh, good is. And a lot of times Jesus in the Bible, he would answer a question with a question. Um, so I guess I have a couple questions. Why do bad things happen to bad people? They don't, they don't deserve that, right? We probably think that they do, but they're kind of already on the wrong and losing side, so we'd really need to like beat that dead horse. I mean, I don't think we got to do that, okay? Um, and, the, and the Bible says uh, rain falls on the just and the unjust. Okay, it doesn't really make sense to me, but we, we would maybe think in our culture that rain would be a bad thing. You know, when it rains, you're gloomy, okay? But back in biblical times, rain was a good thing, right? Rain was a good thing. So uh, I guess another question I have is, why do good things happen to anyone, right? That's not even what we're promised in the Bible, okay? We're promised affliction or tribulation, Okay. And so everyone at some point in their life receives a blessing and also receives suffering. And I think what really I want to get to today is how we're supposed to view those, okay? How we're supposed to, to look at that. I think that's what really matters. And so practically, we're going to go through three different things today that's going to show us how we can be patient in affliction. Forgiveness, purpose, and hindsight, okay? So the first one is forgiveness. Forgiveness takes the power away from people who made us suffer. Okay? One of the most powerful things you can do is forgive someone. That's, that's not what society tells us, but that's true. Okay? Uh, I once heard this, being unforgiving is like drinking poison and expecting the other person who wronged you to die. Okay? <laughs> I think that's one of the best analogies I've ever heard. Um, forgiving a wrong, it, it just it literally makes you more patient. I mean, that's just all there is to it. You can think about road rage, okay? I've never been guilty of that, all right? Uh, if, someone, if someone cuts you off and they're yelling at you and honking, uh, it's kind of a big deal, and you think, yeah, that's a perfect picture. That's me, all right? Um, that, that, that's a perfect picture of their road rage. But if, if someone is doing these things, you know, they majorly cut you off, you swerve, you almost wreck, okay? And then you go get gas, and someone is pumping unleaded at the diesel at the diesel pump, okay, and you blow your top, okay, because it's not easy to be patient after you just had something bad happen to you and you can't let it go, all right? Um, so the better way is to 
to move on, to forgive and let it go. Okay? You know when you've forgiven someone when you can sincerely hope the best for that person. Okay? And that's not easy to do. Or even, uh, and a lot of times I'll talk about the benefit of the doubt. Okay? If that person cuts you off, okay, maybe they're late. Maybe they're on their way to see a sick family member. Maybe they're on the way to the ER. Okay? I don't want to talk about whether or not that's true. What I'm saying is, it's the way you view it that matters. Okay? So forgiveness can give us power, and it steals the power from others to have power over us. Basically, it steals it back from them. Okay? I know I talk about Joseph all the time, and I know I talk about this verse all the time, but it's so pertinent to the situation. Okay? We're going to go to Genesis 50, 12 through 21. <clears throat> Genesis 50, 12 through 21. Um, this is Joseph's in Egypt. All his family's in Egypt. Jacob has just passed away. Um, they take him to bury him. And this is where we pick up. Thus his sons did for him as he had charged, him being Jacob. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave on the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham had bought along with the field for a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph. They wouldn't even come and talk to him. They sent someone else. And they said, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. There's a lot of fear going on here. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. It's theorized that between the time when Joseph was sold into slavery to when he became second in command, basically, in Egypt, was 26 years. 26 years. I'm 32. It's almost my whole life. Okay? You're telling me that he's comforting his brothers at the end of the story? Well, he's speaking kindly to his brothers? Okay? Joseph is a powerful person. He's uh, got prestige in Egypt, uh, but even more so than that, he's powerful enough to forgive. 26 years of wrong. 26 years of wrong to him, he forgave. Okay. There's other examples of this that I wanted to highlight. John Bunyan is one of them. I think we have a picture of him, maybe. Yeah, that's him, some old guy. Okay, so John Bunyan was in prison for preaching the gospel. While he was in pr prison, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Um, he worked on it. He, he got out of prison, actually, and then he went back in, and then he finished it. Okay? Pilgrim's Progress is a book that not a lot of people read nowadays, um, but it's the second most popular printed, second most printed book in the world behind the Bible. Okay? And he wrote it in jail. All right? We can think of a lot of books, actually, that were wrote in jail. Okay? We can think of a lot of those. Both of these examples highlight the importance of seeing purpose in your suffering, though. See, John Bunyan saw a purpose to his suffering. So did Joseph. Okay? And uh, I would say that I'm the type of person, and you guys probably know this, but I, I have to know why, okay? It's a weakness. It's a question that I'm constantly asking. Well, why? Why? And it's funny. When my toddlers do it, it drives me nuts. Um, because a lot of times, if I do know the reason why, I can bear something longer, if that makes sense, okay? If only, if only we're going to talk about this later, but if, in hindsight, Joseph, if only he knew what was going to happen to him for those 26 years, right? But he trusted God, okay? He knew there was a purpose. So in the Christian life, we don't always get an answer from God as Job did, okay? But God did give us his word where we can find answers, and I have those highlighted up there. Romans 8, 28. Okay, I don't even have to look. It's uh, God works together 
everything for the good of those who love him. Okay? That's hard to believe, but it's true. All right? Uh, Romans 12 is another, or not Romans 12, Hebrews 12 is one I wanted to highlight. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. We'll start at 4. It's talking, the, highlight, the title in my Bible says, A Father's Discipline. You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Okay? So what this verse is basically talking about is, is your earthly father, uh, you may remember, had disciplined you, and you didn't like it when you were a kid. Okay? I can think of times where I was going to touch the stove and someone slapped my hand. Okay? I'd rather have a slapped hand than a burned hand. Okay? I can think of that now. All right? But the thing about it is, is when we talk about God disciplining us, it's perfect discipline. Okay? That's hard for us to imagine, perfect discipline. All right? Um, there's also another verse I wanted to highlight. It's Acts 14, 22. Acts 14, 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Going back to my road rage example, maybe instead of justifying the actions of others, we should be asking God, why must this be? Kim Meter is a, is a, is a queen, basically, at this. I have a picture over here. Yeah, Kim Meter. Okay? She's an author, and my wife's a huge fan of hers and has read many of her books. Her life is insane. Her life is, is it's just crazy. Basically, she lives by three things. Pray, listen, and do. That's what she lives by. Okay, so she has a horse ranch. I do believe it's in Oregon. She has a horse ranch, and this horse was sick, and they were giving it everything they could, and they couldn't figure it out, and it wasn't getting well. I think it was either, a, I think it was a weekend. It was like a Saturday or Sunday. So she called a vet. She knew it was going to be expensive. Okay, so this vet showed up and, and uh, kind of did a few things or whatever, and, well, just, you know, monitor it, and we'll get back with you on Monday. And, and uh Kim Meter prayed with her team and went out to talk to this lady, this vet or whatever, and this vet just started sobbing. And she was like, you know, basically like, what's going on? And she basically said, when you called me, I had a gun in my hand and I was going to commit suicide. I just want you to know that. Like, wow. Okay? So would you rather have a sick horse to save someone from committing suicide? Yeah, yeah, you would. Okay? And, and maybe there's a reason or a purpose to the suffering, especially if it's for the salvation of someone. Okay, and and I think we can we can think that if if we can think of one person whose salvation would be on the line, what wouldn't we be willing to go through, right? What wouldn't we be willing to go through? John Bunyan was in jail. Okay, Paul was in jail, uh, imprisoned wrongly. Okay, and so I guess that brings me to my third point, which is hindsight. They say hindsight is twenty twenty. Now twenty twenty sometimes people don't know what that means. It means perfect vision. Okay? So when you look back over your life, you have perfect vision of what you should have and could have done. Okay? And uh, I can think of many times that people say to me when I'm exasperated with my, my young kids uh, that I'm going to miss these days. And uh, just as you probably said when they told you that, you probably said, no, I'm not. I want to get through this. I want to get over it, right? I want, when will I ever sleep again? <laughs> when, when will I ever have peace and quiet? But you know what? When they become teenagers, what do people say? Man, it's so quiet, right? It's so quiet in here. I wish it was noisy like it was back in the day. Uh, my friend's kids, he used to say, grush grief. He couldn't say brush teeth, okay? And they worked with them, and they worked with them. Brush teeth, brush teeth. 
brush grief, brush grief, okay? And one day he finally said it, brush teeth, and they go, what have we done? That was so cute the way he said it before. Why did we correct him? No, 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 no. No, rewind, 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 go back, okay? And it highlights, it highlights one of the worst feelings in the world. One of the worst feelings in the world is to get through a tough and difficult time and to look, and re- to look back and realize you basically wasted it, okay? You complained, you whined, you wasted time, you wished it to go faster, okay? You can use the time wisely so that you can look back and see your dependence on God. And then you can look at your life in the present and see your dependence on God and look to your life in the future and know you need to depend on God. Okay? And that's reading his word, meditating on his promises, singing hymns of praise, even in trials, as Paul and Silas did in jail. Okay? You see, one day if you're a believer, you will be in heaven experiencing the literal Garden of Eden. Uh, the world as God intended it to be, without sin, no suffering. Okay? And when that day comes, I'm guessing we'll all look back as Paul did and say that the affliction we had in this life was trivial. It was a light. It was momentary compared to the glory of Christ. He says that in 2 Corinthians. Okay? And I think oftentimes um, what can maybe happen is uh, you can maybe look at the preacher and, and say, uh, you, you can run a risk. You can say, really, how much have you really suffered? Right? You can uh, look at someone who delivers a message like this and say, do they really know so much about it? You're a middle class, you know, person, and you're doing pretty well. How much have you really suffered? Okay, if you only knew. Okay, if you only knew how I have suffered. Uh, my wife and I uh, took the leap and did foster care, and um, basically, in a nutshell, it destroyed me. Um, it totally destroyed me. Um, every day, I would think that they would leave at any moment. Okay. I would try to go to sleep at night, and I would wonder, how am I going to explain to them tomorrow that they're no longer part of our family or in our home, okay? Um, We experienced some victories along the way. We got to adopt one of our kids, and then it looked like he he was going to be the only one that we adopt, and then we got to adopt two of our kids. Well, then the the third one actually went home for a while, and uh, we thought we'd never see him again. Um, In the end, we did... Uh, get to adopt all three of them, but it didn't come without a cost. Uh, I can think of that time, and I was constantly looking over my shoulder, thinking that someone's about to to turn us in for for me, you know, being stern with my kids or whatever, just raising kids, okay? Um, I can think of times when I would just go into the shower and turn the water on and sit there and cry, because I didn't want anybody to see me cry. Um... We, we had a hydrant at our house, at the back of our house, and it was leaking water, and our water bill was getting higher and higher and higher, and I didn't really have the money to rent a, a Mini-X, and so I dug it up by hand. By the way, it was 40 inches in the ground. It was awful. Um, but I measured every inch. Um, I, I remember doing that, and I remember being so upset of, like, why is this even, you know, a hydrant leaking is the least of my worries right now. Why is this even happening? But... I cried out to God, and I basically came to the point where he told me that I needed to do the hard work, okay? And I didn't really know what that would be, what that hard work would be. Um, I can physically do a lot of hard work. You know, I, I pride myself that I can physically work hard, but that's not really what God required of me. He required me of hard emotional work, hard spiritual work, okay? And that comes a little bit more difficult for me. So from the outside looking in, and I think even Pastor Huff has said this before, from the outside looking in, it looks like we're the ideal family, okay? It looks like, it looks like everything just worked out, okay? But that's not how it ended. That's, that's not how it went. It's how it ended, but it's not how it went. But something that helped me tremendously during that time was that God promised to be with me. And that one day, he would wipe away every one of those tears I cried in the shower, okay? He would... He would take away every suffering that I had experienced in this life. And you see, as I close here, I I just want to say that you cannot be patient in affliction all on your own. It's it's basically impossible. Okay? 
And by the way, we see a lot of people in the world who aren't able to do that because they don't have supernatural, it's what it takes, is supernatural intervention. Okay? So maybe this morning you're here and, and maybe you've just been trying harder for too long. You've just been trying harder to be patient, trying harder, trying harder, trying harder. And what you've done is you've done it on your own. Okay? So this morning, what I'd like you to do as we close our eyes here, I just want everyone to close their eyes. And instead of uh, you trying harder, instead of you carrying that load and, and uh, finding yourself failing and being patient in affliction, Lord, that you give it over to the Lord. That you uh, stop trying harder on your own, but you ask for supernatural intervention uh, to make you patient in suffering. Um, we, we can think of ourselves as asking God, or saying to God, what other people meant for evil, you meant for good. And that we love him for that. And so as I pray here, I just hope that you think of those things. Father, uh, thank you for sending Jesus Christ. Thank you that he can live through us and give us the ability to pray continually to be patient in suffering, Lord. Thank you for your word that uh, teaches us how to live this life, this Christian life. And it's not easy. And I pray that everyone here would uh, this week experience patience in their affliction, Lord, and that they would depend on you for that and no one else. In your name I pray, amen. As you turn to the hymn, which is hymn number... 412. I just want to read a couple more verses because really our greatest um, example and motivation to be patient with others when we feel afflicted is Jesus himself. Jesus himself, God himself was incredibly patient with us. We can't even imagine how, how much turmoil we've caused to Jesus, to God. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Isaiah 53, it says, We all, like sheep, went astray. We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him, laid on him the affliction, the affliction, the iniquity of us all. Backing up to verse 3, it says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering, who knew what sickness was. If we think we know what affliction is, Jesus knew it far more. If we, if we think we need to be patient, Jesus knew it far more. It says, He was someone... People turned away from him. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. But we, in turn, regarded him as stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was laid on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Talk about being patient during affliction. Jesus was. Jesus was. He's our greatest example. Our greatest motivation anytime we see, we face any kind of tribulation at all. I want to read one more verse. Second Peter chapter three verse nine says, "The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient toward you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance." You see, God is so patient with you that even though we go our own way, go through our own rebellion, rebellion, He is patient toward you. So that um, you see Jesus, you see his love for you, and in your time, according to his plan, you come to know Christ. Um, don't, don't delay that. Don't put that off. Trust in Jesus. Um, he was afflicted for you so that you can ha find your rest in him. Let's stand together. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, I invite you to come to know Jesus this morning. Uh, just come, and, and I'll pray with you and introduce you to the Savior. Uh, let's sing together.